at the cross where my Savior died. Down where the cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad that I entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Awesome. You do realize the first three verses are talking about saved. You're saved. You're welcome to the Lord. And then realize that he doesn't leave out the ones who are not saved. The fourth verse is this. Hey, you can have it today. Come on. We're going to sing the whole song again, right? Man, we are kicking off revival. All right. Some of y'all are excited, but I'm telling you, we're kicking off revival schedule. We're going to sing the whole song again because, man, that's a powerful. I don't know if you realize that, but, man, that's about who we are. Man, what he's done for us. Go sing it again. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where from cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory. Saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where He took me in. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad that I entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart. fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory
turning over, our next song is 239, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. This is Holy Week, everyone. They will look on the one they have pierced. I like this song. <laughs> song I was trying to find a song that kind of there are two hosannas that in this book that I did not really know and I said they ain't gonna know it but I'm uh, thinking of Palm Sunday and uh, marching in the palm branch means victory I remember I was always studying like school uh, in school all the different so you know olive branch of peace uh, oak branch is strength but the uh, palm branch is victory and uh, I just want to sing this song. It is called He is Exalted. It's a fun one. And I think we've done it in choir. I think so. some of us will recognize it. And uh, it's fun. But he is exalted. Forever his truth shall reign. Exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord forever. His truth shall reign. Exalted, the king is exalted. 
exalted on high. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted forever, exalted at night. We'll praise Him. the Lord for that. He is exalted. Well, this morning we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, so all that would just gather in around the altar. And I, I know uh, there's a lot that uh, have heavy burdens. We have a lot of sick loved ones and things like that. Uh, but this morning, the one thing that I want us to focus on is the lost. Man, we need to pray for the lost to be saved. Because if we're not praying, who's praying? Right? Come on. So we got to pray. I know we've got lost loved ones in our families, and man, we need to call out their name this morning to the Father. And so let's just seek Him today, all right? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to gather in your name. You are the one that is to be exalted. It's not about anything that we have done, just like the song. We can't boast in the things we have done. We boast in the name of Jesus and the cross of Calvary and the death that he died, but that he's risen again. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, that today you just continue to be with us, Lord. Your spirit would just continue to anoint this place. We just continue, Lord, to seek your face. And, Lord, we thank you for all the things that you have done. But, Lord, we have come this morning in great expectation that you're going to continue to do even greater things in our midst. And so, Lord, we ask, would you just continue to help us right now? I pray, Lord, right now, all throughout this place, Lord, you know the needs of our heart. You know the things that are, are burdening us down. You know that we have ones that are sick. We, some of us may even be sick ourselves, but, Lord, we trust you today. You are good and you alone, and we thank you, Lord, for everything that you're going to do in our midst. Lord Jesus, we come to you as well. Lord, we pray for our nation. Our nation's in a time that if there was ever a time that we needed to be a nation that's under God, Lord, it's today. Lord, we need the church to rise up. We need the church to be the church. We need the church to be on the solid foundation so that the rest of this nation that we live in can truly see that there's a difference in who we are. And so, Lord, I pray would you just continue to be with us right now. Lord, we pray for every other nation. Lord, there's a lot of nations that are in turmoil, they're in war, they're in strife, but Lord, the answer is you. And so, Lord, we pray even today, may the church universal rise up all around this world, and may today be a day of reckoning that, Lord, like never before, may a great revival, not just here, but Lord, all over the place, may there be a revival like we've never seen before. Lord, I pray today as we've come into this place that, Lord, our hearts... Lord, they be right where you are. And Lord, your heart is that none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. And so, Lord, we pray for the ones in our families, the ones that are close to us. Lord, the friends that we have, the co-workers that we're with. Lord, may today be the day of salvation in their lives. May they come to know you and who you truly are. Lord, I pray that you just continue to help us right now, Lord. We just continue to seek you. Lord, we trust you and we thank you for how good you have been to us. And Lord, once again, we come in expectation that you are going to continue to be good to us. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Praise the Lord.
Well, howdy. I'm glad I can say that. I've been up north doing missionary work in Indiana, and they talk funny there. I'm so very thankful I don't have to have a translator today. It's so good to see you. i tell you a story before I get going uh, about one of our generals, one of my favorite, one of the first ones, Dr. J.B. Chapman. And uh, in fact, in my library, I have a signed copy of a work that he did. Isn't that cool? You impressed? Don't reckon you are. That's okay. And he said this, uh, he was actually doing a revival in Kentucky, of all places. This is not pastoral license, this really supposedly happened. And uh, after the revival, he saw a lady come down to the altar on the very first night, and she was just bearing her soul at the altar. And she cried and she wept, and, and they gathered around and they prayed with her. The next night, night number two of the revival, she came down the same way, was so heartbroken and devastated and just see the anguish in her eyes, in her body language as she just was weeping at the altar. By the third night, she did the same thing at the end of the service. Dr. Chapman came down, started to pray with her and said, daughter, what's troubling your soul? And she said, my husband, he's not a believer. He won't come to church with me. I don't know what to do. I've prayed for years that he would find the Lord, but he, he just hasn't. And Dr. Chapman said, you know, would it be okay if I come and visit you on your farm? And she said, yes, sir. But he, he, he didn't like preaching. That's okay. I don't like him either. So he gets there, he starts talking to the guy, and the guy takes him all throughout the farm and shows him his orchard and shows him his horses and shows him his mules. And the whole time, Dr. Chapman said, i I, I, I got to stop you. I've been admiring your watch. That is the best-looking pocket watch I think I've ever seen. And he goes, this? He goes, yeah, that. Wow, is that something else? He goes, well, yeah, it was given to me, but it's really not that expensive. Oh, I think it's beautiful. And you know what I need? I need me a pocket watch. And he goes, well, this is just an old pocket watch. If you really need this, I I'll let you do it. He goes, oh, I don't have money to give you. I'm holding services. And I got to tell you, I'm such a poor preacher can't be in debt with you. The only thing I can offer is my sermons. I'm such a poor preacher. And in order to pay this back, you, you pretty near have to come every night. And something about that, I guess, struck the farmer kind of funny. And on night four, he was there. And on night five, he was there. And on night six, he was there at the altar with his wife. So I say to you, I am a poor preacher. And if you're going to get your money's worth, you better come every single service. Otherwise, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And some of you are saying, already there, brother. Already there. I'm so glad that I was invited. We had planned to do this in 2020, and, and COVID happened and changed the world. And, and uh, I'm so very thankful that uh, you have invited me to, to come and speak. I love your pastoral family. They didn't ask me to say that. I do because they pastored my mother, and they loved her. That's something that is very rare. So I love them, and you are fortunate. So I hope you love them back. Don't you love your pastor and wife and family? Yeah, you do. And so you're saying, you're just doing that and come back. No, see, I don't make a living doing this. I do other things. So I'm just going to tell you the truth. I don't have to make you happy. In 
Isn't that good? Praise the Lord. Some of you are not happy about that. What we're going to do, though, is I'm going to be very transparent with you. I'm going to be very honest with you. And if you're transparent with me, and if you're honest with the Lord, God's going to do a work, not because I'm here, because I am a terrible preacher. But there's something about the foolishness of preaching that's really miraculous. That the words I speak, they have no power, they have no authority, they have nothing. But when it's infused with the mighty work of the Holy Spirit, it goes forth. And the Bible says, I didn't say it, no one else said it, the Bible says it will not come back void. In other words, it won't be empty, it will strike you. The problem is, most of the time, we don't allow it into our heart to seep down deep inside of us to marinate into our soul and so we don't get transformed so we complain and we bicker and we go to McDonald's and say I don't know why I went to church I got video I don't got video some of you got scared I heard that silence does he really got video no but God sees everything so here we go. Today signifies Palm Sunday. Jesus riding on a donkey into Jerusalem with the crowd shouting, Hosanna to the Lord. Lord, save us is what that means. Lord, save us. But that's not what they were meaning. You see, they were on this side of the resurrection. They were on this side of the greatest miracle that had ever happened. They were on this side of the crucifixion. So they had a very shallow knowledge of what it means to be a Messiah, what it meant to be Jesus. You see, they were not saying, save me. They were saying, rescue me. That's what they were saying. Bring back the good old days. That's what some of us were saying during that uh, NCAA tournament when we, anyway... At least we got beat by a saint. Bring back the good old days when King David ruled, when we were no longer slaves. Jesus, make us champions again. Deliver us from evil Rome and make us into the empire of old. Bring us wealth and bring us honor and bring us fortune and fame. You know, when David ruled, essentially what they were wanting is they were wanting David 2.0. They wanted a better version of David. You know, like when David was king, right? They, I was with a, a pastor friend, Dr. Sammy Taylor. He was a great preacher, Dr. Sammy Taylor. He was a, I was in the denomination, and uh, we were in a pastor's meeting, and I was young, so it was a long time ago. I was in one of my first pastorates. And he said, all the days of the church of the Nazarene has seen its zenith. And another buddy of mine that's a pastor said, isn't that a TV? I thought the Nazarene back then weren't supposed to watch TV. Bring us back the days of old. See, that's what the Jews were wanting. They were lying on the streets because they were hoping... New David, that new kingdom, that this new world would change, that Jesus would be this warrior like David, this conquering king like David. There we go again, making God into our own image. Because things are better when Jesus lives up to our expectations because if we force Jesus into our expectations then we don't have to live up to his right it's okay you're not gonna scare me if you say hallelujah or something but those Jews gathered with palms in Jerusalem they were shouting Hosanna but in just a few days they would be screaming crucify him execute him, kill him, mutilate him. Because Jesus disappointed. 
Jesus failed to align to their version of what a Savior should look like. They had no choice. When Jesus doesn't save us in the way that we want to be saved, then we have no recourse but to eliminate him from our lives. Jesus, you didn't save my marriage. Crucify him. Jesus, you did not give me that promotion. Execute him. Jesus, you didn't heal my illness. Kill him. Jesus, you did not give me what I prayed for. Mutilate him. But we don't really scream those words, do we? That would be heinous. That would be wrong. We'd be kicked out. We'd lose our Nazarene card. So we do something a little bit more cruel. We just ignore or disregard. Or worse yet, craft our own Jesus. A Jesus that bends to our bidding. That seeks our affirmation. We don't want a master. We crave a magician who magically waves a wand and gives us what we deserve because we deserve it. They wanted David 2.0. But who really is David? David is what theologians would call a Messiah archetype, a, a, a messianic kind of predictor. In other words, David and Joseph and some of these sought after characters of the Old Testament had certain characteristics or tendencies that really exemplified what Christ would be, but only a glimpse. He was much more than that, right? He was much more than that. David demonstrated certain spiritual attributes throughout his life that Jesus would perfect a certain character that Jesus would not emulate but amplify. David is a poor facsimile for those of you who still use faxing. He was a predictor, but David was no Jesus. So when you think of David, you instantly think of King David, I would think, or slingshot giant slayer David. Do you like him? He's cute. My favorite, David, is the slobbering, pretending to have lost his ever-loving mind, weak, humbled, desperate, frightened David. Because I cannot relate to King David, and I cannot relate to a giant slayer. I've killed no giants. But I have been a babbling, frightened, senseless fool who reeked of desperation. Can you identify with that? I can. In fact, one of my favorite stories that God has laid on my heart for months, on, for months, for this particular day, for this particular moment, we're, we're going to read. But I want to remind you, before we get to God's words, not mine, not yours, but God's words, when we get there, don't look at Facebook. Don't text anyone. Don't start thinking about the roast in the oven. Those words, not mine, those words, they have the ability to transform your life forever. So don't play. Don't play marbles with diamonds here. So I'm going to ask you to stand. The text we'll find in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 10 through 22, through the second verse. I'm going to read it to you. And it may sound a little different. I'm reading from an amplified version. But you'll get the gist as you see up on the screen. Then David arose and fled from Saul that day and went to Achish king of Gath. The servants of Kish said to him, is this not David the king of the land? Did they not sing in praise of this one as they danced saying, Saul has slain thousands and David 
tens of thousands. David took these words to heart and was greatly afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So fearing for his life, he changed his behavior in their sight and acted insanely in their hands. And he scribbled on the doors of the gates and drooled on his beard. Then Achish said to the servants, Look, you see that man is insane? Why have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you bring this one to behave like a madman in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers... Boy, isn't that something? When we are in the lowest part of our life and we have just drooled all over ourselves and we try to go to a cave to get away from our disrespect of ourselves, our loathing that we're doing, our family comes over. I got that same family. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard about it, they went down there to him. Everyone who was suffering hardship and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him and, became, and he became captain over them. There were about 400 men with him. Did you catch that? 400 people that were malcontents, depressed, discontented, in debt, all gathered around him. Misery loves company, doesn't it? Father, we ask that you would make these words real to us, that you would hide this human so that your grace could be seen, that your truth could be heard. We ask this in the name that's above every name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So you got to understand the story now. David was once the champion. You know about the giant slayer. He, he slayed Goliath. And you see, Goliath was the Philistine's champion. And in those days, when you defeat the champion, you defeat the country. Right? And later on, David, who was the captain of the army, who led the army, he would once again defeat the Philistines, the evil Philistines, these heathens who were not only enemies of Israel, they were enemies of God. He defeated them. In those days, he had it made. Did you know that after he defeated Goliath, did you know one of his prizes he received was the king's daughter? So essentially, he became a prince. You think about that. My father-in-law is the king. He didn't have to wait in line at no restaurant. He could have been like that. My father's father-in-law. My best friend is Jonathan, the king's son. I'm in charge. In fact, I'm such a hero in Israel song about me that they sing in fact that's what got Saul all riled up you see he started to get jealous to turn away from the Lord so the anointing of the Lord left him and Saul knew that David was the anointed one that David was the one that God was going to make king he was going to lose his authority and his job and pretty soon he went into this paranoia, this madness. And this David, who would at one point musician. I mean, think about David. He's so cool. He, he not only can do a slingshot and kill a giant, he can lead armies, and he can play music. Didn't you just despise those guys in high school? good-looking football captain. Maybe some of you like that. I've forgiven you since then. <laughs> Playing music, all the girls singing songs about you. Don't worry. You age out of that. 
That's David. He had it made. He wasn't a bad guy. He didn't do anything wrong. In fact, the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart. Here's the thing, folks. In this world, because of original sin, because of the fall, you don't have to be a bad person for you to have a bad life. That's the effect of sin. It skews everything. It doesn't have to be your sin. It's the sin of the world. So what, does, what happens? If you know the story, one day David came in because the only thing that would calm this madness was him playing his harp, his lyre. That's the only thing that would calm the madness of Saul. And this particular day, not even that would do it. So while he's in his music, He's singing probably a good old Johnny Cash song, I reckon. Maybe he was singing, I Walk the Line. I don't know what he was singing. But Saul threw a spear at him. And there it begins. For not months and not days, but for years. Saul is chasing him. He's in exile. He's a fugitive. He's on the run. He loses his wife. He loses his best friend. He loses his position. He loses the palace. And he's a running. Let me tell you something, folks. I want you to hear me, and I want you to hear me good. There is no expiration date of, on pain in this world. There is no expiration date. Some of you have had too much pain in your life, and I'm so sorry. And some of you may have heard a misinterpretation of the gospel in which it says if you're a Christian, you should not have any pain. Parity theology, that garbage is not biblical. Let me tell you something, folks. Our faith is built on a cross. Why should we expect less? Uh-oh. Can you go back to making jokes? I liked it better then. <laughs> Listen to me, folks, please. This is the truth. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. This is the gospel. This world has been marred and damaged. And because of that, its only option is to produce pain. Do you hear me? Even my Fitbit stopped. Do you understand me? Why is that important? Because then we next part. Here we have David. He's on the run. This is what happens. This is human nature. When the world gets too much, we get disoriented and we run the wrong way toward the enemy. That's what he did. He ran into the enemy. And then he realized what he had done. He was the enemy, folks. He was the enemy. In those days, in that time, and still in this time, in some places, if you are the enemy and you come to the enemy, they execute you. So he was afraid. This fearless giant slayer, this military genius, was afraid. And so what did he do? He started foaming at the mouth like he got rabies or something. He started kind of marking on things, acting as though he had lost his mind because he was afraid that if he didn't do that, he'd die. And the king says, essentially in the Hebrew, it's really clear, he says, don't I got enough crazy people around me? Why are you bring me one more? That's, that's an Andy Hughes message version. So they let him go. So now he even loses his self-respect. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a place so desperate that you do things that you never thought you'd do?
So he stumbles into the cave of Adullam. I love the cave of Adullam because to me, the cave of Adullam is what the church ought to be. It ought to be the place that people stumble into when they're depressed and, and they're broken and they're discouraged and they're discontented and they're disenchanted and they walk in there and they stumble into this darkness, into this dark, misty place. And they find others there that are broken and damaged because there's not a single person on this earth that's not broken and damaged at one point in their life. And let me tell you something, and listen to me. There's no reason that God would want me to preach this sermon to you today unless someone or a lot of someone's in this place is in his place, stumbling in to the cave of Adullam. Welcome to the cave. Right? But then let's go back to Palm Sunday. Are you serious? The Jews wanted that guy instead of Jesus? They wanted that guy instead of Jesus? Are you serious? Well, sure. It's a lot easier to put your faith in man than it is in God. Oh, let me tell you something, folks. We don't want a Jesus. Sometimes we want a superstar. We don't want a Jesus. Sometimes we want somebody to affirm the way we live. We don't want a Jesus. We want a David. We want somebody that's going to look the part and sound the part and make me feel good. I want my own Jesus. I'll give Jesus I'll put Jesus away, and I'll get my own Jesus. I'll make my own Jesus. Have you ever done that? What do you mean, preacher? Listen to me. You'll shrink the king of the universe into such a small package that you limit his abilities in your life because you can't handle the fact that he doesn't want to just make you feel good. He wants to transform you. He wants to make you a new person. I like who I am. I like me. I love me. Let me take a selfie. Woo! Both fit. Both feet stood still, so I didn't dance. I'm keeping my credentials. Some of you guys say, I don't know what that means. I used to, when I was a youth pastor years ago, I'd say, here's an impersonation of a Nazarene prom. <laughs> they didn't always get it. So some of y'all didn't either. The wheel was turning, but the hamster was sick. <laughs> Right? Sometimes, sometimes, why do you think there's so many bloggers? And why are people always following? Some people have made the Kardashians their Jesus. Oh, now, you, now you're starting to meddle. Some people have made their politician their Jesus. Ooh, glory, that get me kicked out. Some people. Some people have made their TV preacher their Jesus. Let me tell you something. You listen to me good. No one comes close to my Jesus. No one comes close to my Jesus. And when I'm in a cave and I'm broken and I'm damaged and I'm discontented, there's no one that helps me like my Jesus. I don't believe you. If you don't believe me, you've not met my Jesus. You've made your own Jesus, and he's David 2.0. He's not Jesus. I want my Jesus. I want my Jesus to make me feel good. I want my Jesus to make me money. I want my Jesus to love me. Right? 
That sounds less like Jesus, more like Ernest T. Bass. Isn't that silly? Why would we do that? Why would we do that? Let me tell you the good news, though. This is the good news. This is the good news. It's in that cave that David empties himself of himself. It is there that God stopped being something he fought for. And he became someone he clinged to. It is in that cave that he stopped making God into his image and allowed God to shape him, form him, and transform him. You see, I, I don't want a better version of David. Although at times, I'm going to admit to you, I have sought power and fame. And there are times I have joined the chants of the crowd that screamed, Hosanna, save us, but save me in the way that I deem best is what I was really saying. The way I want you to save me. Because if you save me your way, Jesus, you get all of me. I got to give up every nook and every corner and every cranny of my life. That's what holiness is about, folks. Holiness is wholeness, W-H-O-L-E-N-E-S-S. -S. Every inch, every thought, every feeling, every moment. Well, I don't want that. There are certain things I want. I want, I want Jesus on Sunday. I want David on Monday. I want to be like Joshua on Tuesday. Because I like to march around. Right? See, when Jesus really gets you, he gets you. But let me tell you something, folks. He didn't get David in the palace when he was, when he was uh, the apprentice to the king. David had to go to the cave. And here's the thing that's really funny. As we are beginning Passion Sunday, listen to me. As we are beginning Passion Week, listen to me. You know what? That tomb that Jesus was in, it was essentially a cave. Listen to me, folks. Transformation doesn't happen in the palace or with the Palm Sunday parade. It happens in the cave. It happens in the midst of your darkest moments. It happens when you give everything up and you look at yourself a different way and you admit who you are and you stop playing games and you say Jesus give me take me all of me not a part when you buy a car you don't buy a wiper blade you buy the whole car well, I don't want to do that then you'll never get Jesus the church is not the church because the church traded in the real Jesus for David 2.0. So people don't get transformed, they get entertained. Their lives don't get changed. That's the truth. Stop looking for a David. Let me introduce you to the real Jesus. He's bigger than your Jesus. He is more than what the world says he is. He's greater than a king and a president and even the American way. He is the redeemer, redeemer of life, the hope giver. He turns your cave of a dullum into a training ground for victory. Because you see, those 400 malcontents, we found out down the road, if you continue in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, those 400 malcontents, those depressed, in debt, desperate people, they start training in that cave. And they become the leaders of David's cabinet when he becomes king. And they become the most 
incredible military force on this earth at that time. But they couldn't have got there if it wasn't for the cave. Folks, do you really want Jesus? Do you really want him? You want a part of him? You want to make your own Jesus? You want to form him a different way? I don't know. I don't know yet. He does. And I'm preaching this sermon on this day because he has a message for you. I don't believe that. That's why you'll never be transformed. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. I know I... Is that okay if I do that, Pastor? All right. I don't care what you sing. I don't care what you play. I don't care... As long as you can do it, you still get to heaven. But I want us to really consider. Some of you are broken. And you may come to church every Sunday, but you are bitter because the Jesus that you prayed to didn't give you what you wanted. So you made your own. And truth be told, You've been a little discontented, maladjusted, depressed, and broken this whole time. Truth be told, you've blamed Jesus. Truth be told, you've never been transformed. Because you're not willing to give him everything. As you think and as you pray, I'm going to ask you to really check your heart. And I know you're saying, just get it over with. I'm done. I don't want to hear anymore. The very fact that you're trying to stop it is the very reality that he's trying to give to you. So what do you got to do? Oh, it sounds easy, but it's not. Don't anybody cheapen grace for you. When you really come to the Lord and you give him everything, it is a true decision. What do you give up? You give up everything. What do you get? You get a stone that gets rolled away. You get a cave that stops being dingy. You get a resurrection. Let me tell you something, folks. If you will crucify yourself with Christ, you will be resurrected with Christ. And you'll have the glory of heaven come inside of you. And you'll never be the same. And you'll never look back. And you'll say, glory to God in the highest. I'm getting what I wanted. But you'll never get there. You'll never get there. If you're not looking for the real Jesus today, I'm going to ask you to stand. Boy, wouldn't this be a day you could begin Passion Week by giving Him your passion. I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to ask you to pray and seek God's movement. And the evil one is whispering in your ear. So just hold on. They'll only sing three verses and you can get out. You, you can get comfortable again. Go back to your palace. But you won't get transformed there. You got to come into the cave with us. We're too close to Mammoth Cave for you not to join now. Come to the cave.